So for the last panel of the day, uh, it's called What Grinds My Snarks. Um, we have four great panelists that I know, everyone. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves, and, um, and then we'll jump in into some questions. So Elena, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so my name is Lena, and I'm working in a company called Beanstalk, and we are a privacy queen company. We haven't launched yet, but um, let me know if you want to hear more later. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Howard. Uh, I run a fund called Decrypt, uh, which uh, has a thesis around the blockchain infrastructure, uh, privacy-preserving protocols, and early-stage ventures. Uh, my name is Dong Song. I'm the founder and CEO of Oasis Labs and also a professor in computer science at UC Berkeley. And at Oasis Labs, we are building uh, technologies combining blockchain and privacy techniques uh, to build a platform uh, to make it easier to build privacy-first applications. I'm Ayo Akinyele, uh, CEO, <coughs> excuse me, uh, CEO and co-founder at Bolt Labs, uh, building anonymous payment channels for Zcash uh, and Bitcoin. Um, and my background is uh, cryptographic engineering um, at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm a big believer in privacy as a right, um, and glad to be here. Thank you. So what grinds your snarks? <laughs> what excites you about privacy? Why is it relevant for yourself and in your lives? Um, can you share a little bit? Yeah, um, privacy is a no-brainer, and it's a huge opportunity. Um, we have over $200 billion of market, market cap in the space, and it's all used for speculation. It's not actually used for real businesses. And part of the reason is because we don't have the same paradigm in the crypto world. If I do business with someone, they will immediately see my, all my financials, my entire books. Um, that's not something that we have in the real world. And so privacy to me is a no-brainer. If we want to have crypto be used for more than speculation, it has to have privacy techniques. I, I, I like to think about it from two perspectives. There's like the individual, and then there's also the enterprise or company perspective. Um, if we take, for example, from an individual, let's say I owe Ronan money, and uh, you know he gives me you, you own me money, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he gives me his bank account number. Uh, I can wire money to him, and uh, it reveals nothing about his spending behaviors, his financial history, or or, or any of his balances. And um, this is something that if he gave me his Ethereum address with, and I sent money to that, I would learn everything about his his balance, about his spending behaviors, what DApps he likes, um, all sorts of information that otherwise was not uh, a part of the initial consent. And uh, this is something that we find uh, to be troublesome, um, and it's something that you actually see as a monetizable business today, um, in part uh, from a, a lot of aggregators like Chainalysis and Elliptic and whatnot. Um, but if you go more for the enterprise or organizational side of things, um, blockchains are today fully public. And this is a great feature that allows you to um, audit uh, the, the correctness of a chain's history but it comes at a cost, which is that everyone sees everybody's state. And um, for companies who have IP, who have trade secrets, who have intellectual uh, property that, that is a part of that business logic, it becomes difficult for them to embed it without revealing it to everybody else. And we've seen, for example, from you know, uh, uh, companies like JP Morgan who have released uh, uh, decompilers for solidity binaries. And uh, th there's other types of techniques to effectively try to derive that, that secret information that, that's been kept in that code. Um, uh, as we all know, data, we say that data is a new oil. So today, really, uh, data is extremely important and valuable for us to make better decisions uh, and uh, to help us to uh, essentially inform us uh, how to take the best actions. But however, as we all know, that data, uh, a lot of this data is really sensitive. Uh, either it's financial data, or it's uh, healthcare, medical data, and so on. And so what we see today is a few issues uh, uh, essentially uh, rooted from this uh, need of handling sensitive information. So on, on one hand, we see that users are losing control of their data. And also, a lot of them are even losing trust at companies, like what Howard just mentioned. Um, and also, on the other hand, we see that companies are also actually um, at severe risk. Uh, either it's from regulatory compliance side, or they get hacked and they lose users' data. And furthermore, we see a lot of issues of data silos, where valuable data is actually being locked up and is not being utilized because of the lack of privacy uh, enhancing technologies and so on. So given all this, uh, we do need to develop better technologies to address. It's not just like privacy, of course, it's a very, you know, 
overloaded in the broad term. But really, I think the reason people care about privacy here is because right now, it's um, a limiting factor for us to address all these issues, to enable us to extract value out of data and also at the same time to protect a user's interest. So, so you mentioned, John, b before I, I mean, you mentioned there's been a lot of technological improvements, right? Because we've been talking about this privacy for, I mean, for a long time. It's not the first time we hear about privacy, and uh, I think blockchain uh, and like brought privacy to the attention of the public more than before. Um, what, what happened in the last year and a half or two years that um, really changed the paradigm in terms of privacy technologies that's so much different than what we had about you know, five years before, for example? Um, I, can, I can start. Um, there's two things. One, there's a behavioral shift. Uh, people are actually caring more about privacy. A year ago, that wasn't the case. Uh, when I started this project, people actually told me, why are you working in privacy coin? Nobody cares about privacy. And now, like, you know, with, with Facebook and Cambridge and, and, and Analytica and the entire nation basically being swayed, um, people are starting to care more. So there's that. And on the technical side, uh, zero knowledge proofs have been seeing light speed kind of advancements in, in technology. Um, Zexi came out from Berkeley, uh, Supersonic was the latest one, Plonk, uh, there's Darks, the Snarks, there's so much going on. Um, and there's suddenly interest from both the, like, the academic side as well as the need to commercialize this tech. So, yeah. I, I would add a point, which is that people have realized privacy tech is useful for more than just privacy. Um, oftentimes, this technology is also useful for uh, auditability or integrity of your, uh, of your logic, of your computations. And they're, they're starting to find use cases that are beyond just pure privacy. Uh, that's something that, uh, you know, it, it solves a lot of the problems that we even have in, in the crypto space today, where, for example, on Ethereum, um, you know, all, all validators must rerun all computations for all time to verify the correctness of a chain's history. That's a lot of wasted uh, computations, and it, it, takes a lot of, it takes a lot of energy and, and time. And so, um, you know, one way that you could do this is to actually encapsulate, um, as part of a proof, a zero-knowledge proof in this case, that execution. And if the proof is fast to check, then the computation was fast to check. So a computation that could have taken five seconds or 50 seconds or five days um, could be verified in what amounts to about five milliseconds uh, with today's technology. And that's something that people are starting to realize actually creates a whole new model for how we can uh, do computing in, in a, in a multi-party system. And uh, this is something that I think will lead to new avenues uh, that are beyond just privacy. And uh, you know, that's not to say privacy isn't important, but that you actually get privacy kind of almost as a side effect for free if you're looking at it from that lens. Aya, do you want to tell us a little bit what, what exactly Bold is doing? Um, and then what? Yeah. So by extension, uh, I, I agree with everything Aleda and, and Howard have just said. Uh, like, extending this to off-chain protocols, I mean, the same problems uh, exist in terms of the lack of privacy or the, the unavailability of privacy as an option. And so our focus has been how do you we actually you know, enable privacy for off-chain protocols in a way that doesn't um, harm the user experience and we can get usable payments. Um, and you know, channels are one building block for um, uh, scaling the, the, the base layer, but like, you know, it's being used for a lot of different purposes. And so um, we want privacy to be a, an option so that if applications required in the future, they don't have to do other things like, you know, um, rely on, on obfuscation techniques uh, to try to compensate for the lack of privacy at the channels level. And so we're you know, breaking down the, the protocol so that it can be private by default so that users don't even have to think about it. So you mentioned privacy is an option. So I think a lot of people read the Multicoin uh, article recently that said that uh, privacy is just a feature, it's not a product, right? right? Um, what do you think about that? Um, they're wrong. <laughs> uh, so um, privacy is a lot harder than people think. Uh, the naive kind of approach is, oh, well, I can sprinkle privacy on top of existing solutions. Like on Ethereum, we have Aztec. And not to belittle their work, they're a great team. But when you have such a system, putting privacy on top is a lot harder. So for example, on Ethereum, the best you're going to be able to do is just hide the amounts. Now, if I'm going to go to a Starbucks that's near my house and buy a coffee, 
then my stalker, for example, doesn't care how much I paid for my coffee, right? They, if they see the sender, the amount, that's like all the information they need. So just hiding the amounts is, doesn't actually get you all the way there. Uh, the other argument was like, well, we can put like privacy on Bitcoin. Um, and the naive approach is like, well, uh, Wasabi has mix it, like um, you know, built-in mixers, um, and there's just been so many like academic journals, papers, talks. This disproves that mixing actually gives you privacy. Um, so it's most definitely uh, an entire product. It's it's uh, you're not going to um, you're not going to have privacy as a feature with an already existing system. Privacy can't be a feature, like it has to be a product. And it's because you can't build a, a, a feature that's privacy uh, on top of something that's public. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Like, um, it's like uh, on, on Ethereum, if I go and try to add on some like privacy thing on top of that, great, the computation itself could be private. But remember, we have to pay gas for everything on the system. And the gas is effectively how you're gonna link yourself with any, any information there, and, and even more so that uh, in, in this deployment that it's unclear um, how you're going to facilitate multiple parties for, for an operation um, if you don't have, if you don't have a, a, a private system to begin with. And so um, th this is where like, you have to start with a private system to, be, to begin with, and then you can add uh, the, the transparent or public nature of it uh, as an option. Um, and if anything, I would say transparency is, uh, is a feature in this case, and right. um, privacy is the product. And also for privacy, as Har mentioned, essentially you need a full stack solution, especially uh, as you go beyond um, you know, just privacy coin, when you talk about actually privacy for data usage and so on, then you re uh, privacy itself is a very complex concept. Mm. And you really need to handle all the different aspects related to privacy. Uh, so it needs a full stack solution. Yeah, and I would also add that like privacy is a spectrum. You know, we've seen a whole bunch of different um, techniques being deployed today with mixed results in terms of what uh, an adversary can learn about the users that are um, uh, using that technology. And um, I would add that like it's it's a property, not just a product. It's a property of the you know of the of the base blockchain. The off every layer that builds on top of, um, of, of on the blockchain has to have uh, privacy as a property. No, otherwise, you know, things fall apart. Yeah, th there are things where you want it to be private by default, and then there are things where you want it to be public by default. Like, right. if I'm, and there's, and there's a spectrum too, like as, as I said, like if, I, if I'm voting, right, maybe what I want to do is show everyone that I voted, but not show them my vote. And like, that's, that's where you have this kind of hybrid, this middle ground. But if I'm the guy that's tallying all the votes, maybe I want this to be fully, fully public, the, the result, but I don't want to leak who uh, all the participants were. And there's, there's, there's this duality where like, you're trying to find the right balance for different applications. It's kind of when you go on Venmo, there's like the, the, the like, only me, then there's like the friends, and there's the public. Like, people want to show it for different reasons. Um, if it's a, very public, uh, uh, it's a very public transaction, it means that there's likely utility for other people to see that. Whereas if it's just a private uh, transfer between, say, like, you know, me and Elena, then like, maybe it's, it's not relevant for other people, and, and even more so that it might, be a sensitive, uh, it might be a sensitive transfer. Maybe you guys are in the middle of a merger or acquisition or some type of a deal where you really don't want other people to know about it in advance of the announcement. And so, you know, these are things that it, it, it warrants having a spectrum and an option here. And uh, it's, it's unclear whether we have that in existing systems in deployment today. So let's talk about regulations. And then basically we all heard that Zcash is being delisted from a few exchanges, um, whether it's come from top down or it's not clear to me yet why it happens, but it's a lot of basically um, open questions. But how does it? What is the perception from the from the public eyes? Do you think it's affected negatively? Um, do you think it's basically holding it privacy technology back uh, because of that, or it's actually doesn't really matter? So I think it's really unfortunate because it supported the misconception that you know privacy is a niche uh, feature or something that can be. Um, excluded from the, the fabric of a digital currency. Um, and I think that, like, the, I think they're going to regret their decision, but at the end of the day, it's really up to us to have a grassroots movement um, to force them uh, to change the policy in response to users adopting it and proving that um, it is something that they want and need, and they have direct use cases that, um, that they care about. Um, and so I think 
the, it's, on, it's, it's on us to improve the privacy technology, make it more usable and accessible, um, but at the same time explain to the regulators that we can kind of achieve this balance where um, we have um, you know, privacy for uh, the public or from the public, but are able to satisfy the regulatory requirements uh, when it makes sense. You know, so that's. You know, exchanges care about their bottom line, and like just like any good business, you care about you know making money. And so, um, for, for 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 Zcash and and for for Monero and for these privacy coins right now, they're kind of facing this tug of war battle, right? Like um, you've seen with uh, FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, that they've. Uh, issued these proposals to say that anonymity enhanced currencies uh, have uh, or, or, or should be subject to um, extra scrutiny, uh, enhanced due diligence, if you will. And uh, this is something that, you know, if I'm, if I'm an, an exchange operator, I'm going to take this very seriously because that means I, I have to uh, deploy extra infrastructure to manage this. But it, it turns out even in that case that, you know, it, it's a bit of a misconception even right now, and this is where I say it's a tug of war, is that, um, first off, those are proposals that haven't gone live, but secondly, um, for the actual uh, uh, enhanced due diligence, it doesn't just apply to, to anonymity enhanced currencies, it also applies with respect to the travel rule, and that applies for all cryptocurrencies. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, scrutiny that's kind of going around right now, in part because people aren't sure and there's uncertainty, and uh, this is where, uh, you need to not only set precedents and clarify it, but also like there has to be you know public support. Like you know, it's it's almost like putting out a feeler to say how how many people care about this. Uh, will this will this affect my my bottom line? Because if I'm shutting off these markets, it obviously hurts my revenues. And so um, th there's a there's a there's a fiscal decision in the making here, and and I also think that a regulatory decision in the making. Yeah, so um, privacy coins in general have had a much harder time with regulation, um, and primarily it's education. I think we need to actually educate policymakers that privacy is not a dirty word. Um, and I'm also fairly optimistic. So we have existing chains that have been you know, approved, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and so on, and those chains are now adding privacy features. So privacy is not a thing that regulators can just, you know, kind of reject or, or, or stop. They're happening on chains that are listed everywhere. So regulators actually will need to adjust to the fact that privacy is coming regardless of their, like, decision on it, either on Ethereum, Bitcoin, or on a native privacy chain. So, yeah, it's a matter of them, like, understanding this is kind of inevitable and they should actually uh, adjust to it rather than completely negate it. Um, so Don, you've been you've been working on a lot of use cases with uh, in the healthcare and, and other industries um, that involve privacy, right? And there's it's private it's industries that are very very regulated, like the healthcare industry, for example. Um, what is the feedback that you're getting from companies that you're working with? Um, do they support it? They think they don't need it, or they, they completely um, don't even think about the idea of working with you because because of privacy? Or uh, what's the feedback that you're getting? Um, yeah, so on the Oasis platform, we have been mainly exploring like two main application domains. Uh, one is the open finance, uh, where uh, privacy protection can also help uh, with enabling new applications. And the other one is what we call data sovereignty, uh, essentially helping users and companies to maintain control uh, for their data and rights to data. And also, at the same time, to enable data to be utilized in a privacy-preserving way. And then in this area, um, one uh, vertical that we are seeing a lot of traction is in the healthcare domain. Given that uh, you know, medical data is really sensitive, and uh, we particularly see a lot of data silo problems, in particular in healthcare. So for example, it's really difficult for medical researchers to gain access to medical data to help them do the medical research that they need to find better cures for diseases and so on. So, so for example, we have one clinical trial approved at Stanford Hospital in collaboration with the Stanford doctors there using our technology to help uh, patients to contribute their medical data uh, so their data can be stored in an encrypted form uh, on our platform. And then uh, also there can be policy associated with the data to specify how the data can be utilized. And, uh, and then using secure computing uh, technologies, we can then enable, for example, medical researchers to, uh, to perform analytics and, uh, and so on, on the data in a privacy-preserving manner to help them essentially do medical research that they need. And another area that um, 
uh, we are um, also uh, developing uh, uh, particular technologies for uh, in the space is in genomics. Um, so it's genomic data, of course, is like one of the most uh, sensitive and private data that you have. And also, once the genomic data is leaked out, then you know, like you are not going to change your uh, genomics. And um, actually, um, a few weeks ago, I was just at a genomic conference uh, in Boston. Um, and it's, uh, if you look at the standard practice in the space, it's quite, uh, sometimes it's, it's a bit crazy. Like, uh, for example, so they do have very complex process a medical researcher needs to go through to apply to get access to, for example, genomic data to do their research. But once they get the access, then they get a copy of the data, and then you have no idea what happened to the data, how they use the data, where, where the data you know, gets stored, and who else gets access to it, and so on. And so we are talking about like, the, you know, the most sensitive data. Uh, so here, we are actually developing technologies to help uh, protecting uh, uh, users' genomic data, and also essentially actually help users to maintain control and be owner of their data, and at the same time to enable their data to be utilized in a privacy-preserving way. Um, so this is a, might be a hard question, but what, what would the world going to look like if we have no privacy at all? Oh, gosh. Um. Communism. <laughs> <laughs> So Dan Bonet was on a podcast um, on uh, the Zero Knowledge podcast recently, and th that exact question was asked. And the funny thing that he said that resonated with me was that you know humans would reinvent mixing, where like if I wanted to trade um, you know potatoes for onions or whatever, you know we would all kind of figure out how to trade in a way that we could preserve our anonymity. And so I mean it, it we want you know privacy. It's just that it it, it needs to be expressed. It, it, it's it, it takes um, it takes the, the 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 technology that that allows people to you know easily access you know uh, privacy uh, to 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 get that. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. But go ahead. No, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I just want to modify the, the the question a bit and say that it's it's impossible for there to not be privacy because. Um, you want a trading strategy? You know, go and watch uh, EtherScan and go and look at ERC20 deposits into exchange uh, addresses. Uh, the minute that, that, that you see that transaction going through, go ahead and start selling uh, the coin uh, on that exchange in advance of it being sold. Like most people only move in and out of these wallets when they're ready to, to go in and actually make a trade. And uh, you know, oftentimes uh, hedge funds will go and basically front run it by just scanning these blockchains. Right now, in, in this space, uh, in, in the crypto space, we don't have these types of regulations in place. But in the, traditional, uh, in the traditional Wall Street space, absolutely we have these in place. Like, there's a reason why when I send from like, my Chase Bank into like, my E-Trade brokerage account, you know, I, the, you, other Wall Street players can't go and see this, this wire transfer in. It's in part because uh, you know, there are certain types of banking level privacy. And uh, we don't have those types of regulations here currently, and people exploit it for, for trading. And uh, I do think that down the line that things, uh, technologies, for example, like Bolt, will allow you to not only instantly uh, deposit and withdraw uh, from exchanges, but also do it in a privacy-preserving way so that you know, other, other people won't see your inbound and outbounds to these exchanges. And uh, I think that it's, it's, a, it's from this kind of financial motivations that it's, it's very clear that you, know, you need to have some degree of privacy here and that people actually will value this, especially if you're, you're going to go and front run your end consumers. Thanks yeah. for the plug, Howard. So this is kind of an old, uh, brought up example um, that has been brought up many times. But in the 90s, TLS basically caused e-commerce to happen um, with like simple encryption. Now people are able to confidently send their credit card information over the wire, and we have you know great industries like literally almost all, you know you know all of our economy is now e-commerce based. Um, so if you remove privacy, that might really stagger the possibilities of industries that we can't even imagine today um, not happening in the future. Anything else? Ayo, <laughs> were you going to say something? So it, it, it does seem like everybody understands that privacy is important. Right. It's still, it's not, people are not pushing for it as hard. There's definitely GDPR in Europe that feels it much heavier on privacy. But in the US, it's not, it's not really a big deal yet. Like, why? I mean, I would disagree with that. I think people are, like, there's literally a behavioral shift where people are caring more and more about privacy. 
Um, people are understanding that them leaking information about themselves on the internet is actually putting them at risk uh, on many different levels. Um, so I would actually disagree. People are caring more about privacy now. I, I think people inherently do value it, but I think that it's in part because uh, we haven't reached scale with, with this tech yet. Um, think about it this way, like how often do you use cryptocurrencies uh, in your day-to-day -day expenses? Um, unless you're playing some dApps or using something online, like I highly doubt you're actually paying with crypto. And I think it's in part because of that that people don't actually value privacy on this yet because it hasn't been a fundamental issue. Um, if we scale this to, let's say, 2 billion users and everyone uses this for merchant goods and, and for actually buying things, you know, it's not like with, you know, before you, a lot of advertisers and third-party marketers go to credit card companies and banks to go and acquire your data and aggregate this uh, for analytics. But uh, here, they can just, anyone can go to the blockchain and, and, and track this stuff. And, you know, there's some very nice, robust models of, uh, of identity linkage uh, using uh, blockchains. And uh, this is something that uh, I think people aren't going to realize is a problem until it's already reached kind of that, that, that problem state. And so, you know, one, one thing that we can do here is to actually bake in this technology from the get-go, from the ground up, so that they have this option to toggle it as they need it. Um, I think... If uh, still today, uh, people don't understand privacy enough. Uh, so I have been a security and privacy researcher for over two decades now. And one thing we continue to see um, is that, uh, right, like when you ask the general users uh, when they, you know, evaluate privacy versus convenience, people in general say, like, yes, users oftentimes they still uh, pick convenience over privacy. Uh, so I do think that it's important for us to change that dynamics and to change that dialogue. And one thing we're also trying, uh, starting to, to recognize is that maybe so privacy alone, uh, depending on how you talk about it, maybe it's not enough. So, uh, so one thing we are actually trying to raise awareness is there's privacy on the other side is it's about your rights. So for example, your rights to data. Um, just like... Uh, um, property rights in the, you know, in the beginning, also people didn't really understand that property actually is your right, it's your ownership. And only once uh, property rights was established, that really enabled um, you know, new business models, new economic activities, and so on, that really propelled uh, huge growth in, uh, in the economy. And similarly, I think today we don't have a notion of users' rights to data. There's no established um, laws or regulations to that. But we hope that uh, that will change, that people will start to recognize more and more that it's not just about protecting your whatever, your secret and so on. It's more that you, your data is valuable, and it should be your right. And, and uh, by establishing that right and enforcing that right, that can enable new business models that can also bring new benefits to users. And hopefully, this is also a new way for users to recognize the importance of privacy, and in particular, in this case, is their rights to the data. So I would add uh, to that uh, the, the effect of social media um, and the lack of private in, privacy in that context. And so for us, um, I think you know, Facebook has definitely uh, made it harder to convince users that they should care about their privacy just because of the, the things that have, that have happened over the last you know, few years in terms of impacting elections, uh, impacting you know, what companies can, can glean from the data that's been collected. Um, and so um, if you couple that with uh, cryptocurrency and the fact that you know, the HODL mentality still prevails, um, it's still like a more speculative investment, um, you know, getting to the point where it can be used as a medium of exchange um, and you know, on a, on a mainstream level is, I think, what needs to happen um, in addition to us adding uh, privacy by default you know, to change the, the narrative. Okay, I think we're running out of time. So thank you very much for coming. I appreciate uh, all the insights about privacy. None of us is biased about privacy at all. Um, but <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for coming. Thank you.